continuing on with the true role that microorganisms play in disease. We've already looked at the cycle of life. I've shown you how the cycle of life plays on the planet. It's actually the garbage collectors. And if it wasn't for these microbes, there'd be so much rubbish on the planet, you call it trash, we wouldn't be able to walk on the planet. Understanding the role that they play on the planet Earth, understanding the role that they play in the running of the human being, we, we can realise that what we need to do is work with them. And if they are out of control, we need to ask ourselves why are they out of control? Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion, to every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. Or as the proverb says in Proverbs 26 verse 2, the curse causeless shall not come. There, there is always a reason. So if someone has a bad cough and they're coughing up yellow lumps, rather than go to the doctor and get a course of antibiotics, we should be asking, why are they there? But unfortunately, antibiotics are used a little too freely today. This is being acknowledged by medicine and doctors are being told to stop prescribing so much because the problem is that some people are having two or three courses every year, then they get a quite a serious illness and the antibiotics aren't doing what they're supposed to do because they've become immune to them. What is an antibiotic? 1929, Alexander Fleming was growing bacteria in flasks in his laboratory. He came in one morning and all the bacteria was dead. He knew Newton's third law of motion. Why is my bacteria dead? He looked around his laboratory and there was nothing there that would indicate that it would kill his bacteria. He looked at the open window and he noticed as the sun shone in, there was a particular dust coming in on the rays of sun and he watched it and it came in and it landed on his bacteria. So he went a little bit further and he looked out and he saw that it was coming, this dust, from a plate of fruit that was sitting in the, top, the next story window. And in the plate of fruit, there was a mouldy orange. We may all remember this from school. That mouldy orange was giving off a dust. Now that dust has the, orange, the mold spore, but that dust also has a to highly toxic gas. It's as if the, the mold says, this is my orange and no one else is going to get my orange and it gives off this toxic gas to kill off anything that might try and get his orange. What might try and get the orange is other bacteria, yeasts and funguses. So this dust from the mouldy orange settled on the bacteria that Alexander Fleming was growing and it killed it. Alexander Fleming called the mould penicillium. He called the mould waste, which is far more toxic than the mould, penicillic acid. The penicillic acid is the penicillin that we know today. And penicillin has saved the lives of millions, granted. But we've got a problem today, and that is the overuse of the antibiotic and the inability of the physician to find out why these opportunist organisms are active in the body. There is always a reason. And the old saying, nip it in the, in the bud. You know, if someone first get the symptoms of a cold, if they treat it rightly, it should never even get to the point of going way down in the chest. But even if it does get in the chest, if given the right conditions, the body can heal itself. There was a study that I was reading in the newspaper in Australia. A hundred people got the flu, 50 took antibiotics, 50 didn't, and they all got better. You see, the body's designed to heal itself, and it will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. They tested hundreds of different mould wastes. So many of them were so toxic they killed the rats that they were tested on. In other words, penicillin is not deadly enough to kill you outright, but if it continues, it certainly may. To date, they have documented 1.5 million different yeast, moulds and funguses. <laughs> I was lecturing on this one day and my husband said to me later, Barbara, I don't believe that there would be 1.5 million. I said, okay, 
So he did a search and he came back and he said, actually, it's between 1.5 and 5 million. This is quite big. A thousand of those 1.5 million are known to cause disease in mankind. Every mould can give off one or two or three different mould wastes, and it's the mould wastes that are quite deadly. One that you might be familiar with is aspergillus. Aspergillus is a mould, and it gives off an, a uh, mould waste called aflatoxin. And aflatoxin is the most carcinogenic substance ever to be tested. In the book uh, China Study, Dr. Colin Campbell, he was asked to go to the Philippines where children were dying of liver cancer, about eight to 10 years of age. This is a disease that usually only gets adults and it's usually then alcoholics. So he had a look at the lifestyle, he had a look at what they were eating and he found the one common denominator was peanut butter. Every jar of peanut butter he tested had aflatoxin in it. He presumed that the wealthy children would be living and the poorer children were dying. The poorer children living in the villages, they were living and the wealthy children were dying. And the only difference was what they were eating. The poorer children were eating a lot of plant foods, they were eating some soy, a little bit of fish, whereas the wealthy children were eating what Time magazine calls the meat sweet diet. High meat, high dairy, uh, high refined foods, high sugar, and they were the ones that were dying. Colin Campbell was surprised at this because in med school he was taught you must have milk for calcium and you must have meat for protein. Why were the poorer children living and the wealthy children were dying? About that time he was reading in an American medical journal of a study done by an Indian doctor and it was on aflatoxin, liver cancer, because aflatoxin is a mild waste that causes liver cancer. So he was reading it and he was fascinated. This Indian doctor had 20 rats, 10 rats he gave 5% animal protein, the other rats he gave 20% animal protein and he injected each rat with aflatoxin. Now after two years, that's about how long rats live, and they, they experiment on rats because rats' digestive tracts, very similar to humans, we live 70 years, they or 80, they live two years. He found at the end of two years, every rat on the 20% animal protein was dead, and they were all died from liver cancer. But the rats with the 5% animal protein, none of them had cancer and yet they were all injected with aflatoxin. This experiment showed very clearly that it's actually not our exposure to the microbes, it's more what we're doing to the body. But Colin Campbell, he just closed the book. This was against everything he'd ever learned. Do you know, years later, he did his own research and he found exactly the same thing. Never in research do you get 0% versus 100%. And in this research, the Indian doctor get it, got it and he was getting it too. He did another experiment. He gave them 20% vegetable protein, no liver cancer. There was something in the animal protein that was triggering the cancer growth. And there are a few things, once the casein and also the lactose, which is the sugar in the protein, but also when animal products break down, particularly meat in the body, they give off a high sulfur residue, and that's a high acid residue. And these microbes love an acid, acid environment. They're anaerobic organisms. In medicine, mold waste is called a mycotoxin. Myco meaning mold, toxin basically meaning a poison. 1% of doctors today are claiming that Antibiotics are causing more problems than they ever cured. What are they referring to? They're referring to the, the way that the mould gets into the body when a person takes an antibiotic. How many people, when they take a course of antibiotics, then they, they get thrush? What's thrush? Basically, thrush is a yeast problem. There are quite a few doctors from around the world today, specialists, scientists, who are looking at the mould link with disease. There, 
There are four main ways that mould, yeast, fungus can get into the body. One is through the skin, another is uh, by breathing in, another is through ingesting it, and another is sexually transmitted. In the Bible, it talks about exposure to mould. If you go to Leviticus, I think it's around chapter 13, if there's green and yellow strakes, that's old English for the King James Version, the priest is brought in because he will assess. And he said he says the uh, all the mortar has to be taken out, all the stones have to be washed, remorted, and then the house is to be shut up. Two weeks later, the priest comes back if this has grown again. The King James Version calls it leprosy in the house. <laughs> but if you go to the New International Version, it calls mildew in the house. But if it is grown back, then the priest would declare that the whole house has to be dismantled, the whole house pulled down and taken outside the city to an unclean place. In Australia, we'd call it the, the rubbish tip. This is fairly serious. It also talks about leprosy in the King James Version on the, on the clothes. If there's any leprosy on any fabric, it has to be burned. And again, in the New International, it's called mildew on the clothes. In the New International Version, when it's talking about skin, in the King James Version, it talks about leprosy on the skin. I think we've all heard of leprosy on the skin. So in the New International Version, what does it call it? Does it call it mildew on the skin? And if it was being interpreted exactly what the word meant, leprosy would be called mildew on the skin. But it's called infectious skin disease. You can check me out on that one. So this is serious stuff. The Bible's very strong in what it talks about because this stuff is deadly. Colin Campbell found this when he was researching it in the Philippines. There are a few authors that have written books on it. One's Dr. Tullio Simoncini, who's an Italian oncologist. He wrote a book called Cancer is a Fungus. If you go into Google and, li and look at the link between fungus and cancer, you'll be surprised at how much is out there now. A person can have a fungal or yeast presence in their body and not have cancer, but remember they're just opportunist organisms and if it's well fed, it can certainly go into that area. Another one is Dr, uh, well his, this guy's a professor, Constantini. Now he's former head of the World Health Organization Department of Mycology and he has written three books on the subjects. Department of Mycology is the department that studied fungus. After 20 years of research, he put all his findings into three books. Some of his books have 30,000 research papers, medical research papers, showing the link between cancer and fungus. There's another book by Dr. Robert Young called Sick and Tired. He's an American doctor and he also does a very good job showing the history of the microbes. He's got one chapter where he calls it the lost chapter in, this, in the history of biology, showing that medicine pursued bacteria but almost ignores the other microbes. But as you can see in the cycle of life, they're part of the cycle of life. So I'm going to give you a couple of illustrations to show you. So we're going to be looking at two brothers. One is Healthy Harry and the other one is Sick Steve. So Sick Steve and Healthy Harry are brothers. And Sick Steve, he doesn't exercise, doesn't drink water, has too much alcohol every night, eats too much meat. He thinks Healthy Harry has taken all the fun out of life because Healthy Harry doesn't go to the pub with him. Healthy Harry exercises every day, eats a plant-based diet. Cousin Colin visits and Cousin Colin has a bad cough and Cousin Colin coughs. He coughs all over Sick Steve, he coughs all over Healthy Harry. In, in meantime saying, oh sorry, sorry, but I, <coughs> I've got a very bad cold. Now when he coughs over sick Steve, what's in those little drops, droplets of mucus? They're little microbes. They're little microbes that are busily working in his chest because he's got this cold. Now, as soon as they get into sick Steve, they basically say, wow, we've hit the gold mine. 
there's a lot of waste in here to eat up. And look, he keeps giving the body peanuts, which have mold in them, <laughs> meat, which is very high in acid, alcohol. So can you see that these microbes basically think they've hit the jackpot? They've got a lot of waste to eat up in the lungs because the, the lungs are pretty sad because six Steve's a smoker. You see, they're just there to clean up. Now, the same situation basically happens with healthy Harry. He gets coughed on too. But they cough on healthy Harry and the microbes go, there's nothing to eat in this body. You see what they eat? They eat waste. They get fed well by sugars. By the end of the day, sick Steve is very, very sick. Whereas healthy Harry, he's not sick at all. Did you know that on his deathbed, Louis Pasteur, he made this statement, he said, it's the microbe is nothing, the organism is everything. And he was absolutely right. It's not the microbe, they're everywhere. It's the condition of the body, as my illustration of Sick Steve and Healthy Harry shows. But let's say Healthy Harry's just been on a holiday, maybe surfing in Hawaii, didn't eat as well as usual, you know, breathed in some plain fumes, which can be pretty toxic. So when he's coughed on, the microbes have a little bit to eat there. By the end of the day, healthy Harry's got a sore throat. As soon as he gets that sore throat, he, pull, he pulls in the SWAT team. What's the SWAT team? He goes to the gym, he has a big workout, he goes in the hot steam, cold shower, hot steam. Those hydrotherapy treatments boost the immune system. They boost the bone marrow to make more white blood cells. He decides not to eat an evening meal that night. He's going to stop digestion so all his body's energies can go to, to dealing with this cold he feels coming on. He uh, has what we call a flu bomb. He crushes garlic, ginger, I think a bit of eucalyptus oil, some cayenne pepper puts it in some hot water with lemon and honey, drinks that down, the, the nature's natural antibiotics, and he goes to sleep. He has a big glass of water by his bed. Every time he wakes up, he drinks more. He has a bit of a fever that night. Do you know fever's your friend? And when all the rubbish is burnt up, the fire goes out, and water will put the fire out. He's drinking lots of water. If you drink enough water, the brain can handle the heat. He wakes up in the morning, his bedclothes are wet, he's sweated a lot that night. Do you know Dr. Kellogg called the skin millions of little sewers because of their ability to throw off the waste. He gets up, has more water, goes on a big run, comes back, has more water. Then he has his antibiotic sandwiches for breakfast. He has some good quality sourdough, you know, your cultured breads. He puts some um, bit of olive oil on that, crush a clove of garlic on each slice, puts avocado and tomato on top. Delicious. There is antibiotic sandwiches. Do you know that antibiotic is six times more potent than tetracycline? Finishes his breakfast, has a couple of pieces of fruit and some nuts, and he goes to work. No one goes near him this day because he's smelling quite strong of garlic. Let's have a look at sick Steve meanwhile. He wakes up in the morning and he is sick. He feels so terrible. In Australia, if someone's sick, we say they're crook. He was crook. He makes an appointment to see the doctor. He loves this doctor because this doctor never asks him uncomfortable questions like, how much water you are you drinking? Uh, are you going to bed early? He doesn't want those uncomfortable questions. So he, the doc puts his pen up and says, what would you like, Steve? He says, well, just listen to my chest, doc. He listens to his chest and he says, whoa, there's a party going on down there. And he gives him antibiotic. Notice what the word antibiotic means, against life. Do you know if we're living organisms, we have to get away from this kill mentality. Anything that has the ability to kill a small organism has the potential to kill a large. And what are we? We're the large. He goes home, takes his antibiotics. What's happening now? Inside his body, the microbes start getting killed off because that's what antibiotics do. But you know, they kill the good and the bad off. 
and it's not long, a few days after being on the antibiotic, he gets jock itch. He's got this itch between his legs. It's getting worse and worse. He goes to the doctor. Doctor says, what am I seeing you for now, Steve? He says, oh, my cough's cleared up, but look at my, my legs. Look at my crutch. Doc says, whoa, yeah, you got it bad, mate. What is it? It's a yeast infection. It's a yeast infection from the, from the antibiotics. On top of that, all the sugar and the alcohols and the meat he's feeding them. So the doctor gives him nystatin. But all that does is that causes mutation of the yeast. Let's look at Steve 10 years later. He starts coughing up blood. Goes to the doctor, he does a test. You got lung cancer. He goes home and healthy Harry says, what's the matter, mate? He said, I've just found out I've got lung cancer. Healthy Harry says, whoa, what's the doctor offering? Well, he can offer surgery, can offer chemotherapy. But you know, the, the statistics on the success of those are not good. You see, if the body's designed to heal itself, we've just got to give it the right conditions. Remember, in case of sickness, cause should be ascertained. Wrong habits corrected unhelpful conditions changed. Then nature is to be assisted in her efforts to expel impurities and re-establish right conditions back in the system. Healthy Harry says, well, this is terrible, Steve. Let me shout you a week at the health retreat to consider your options. Do you know, it's a good idea to do that. Consider your options. Sick Steve comes to the health retreat. He hears the truth on how the body heals, how the body works. He realises what he's been doing to himself. He stops the cigarettes, the steam baths every evening, help with that. He starts to take herbs and he's put on a program. Let me show you the program. Number one, you've got to starve that fungus. What's its favourite food? Waste. You've got to start cleaning up that body. How does the waste come out? It comes out via four organs of elimination. One is the skin. That's why the steam baths are so helpful in cleaning up the body. That's how you assist nature in her efforts to expel impurities. How does nature expel the impurities? Well, a big one is via the skin. Did you know that when the skin is given the right conditions, up to 70% of body's waste can be eliminated via the skin? That's pretty impressive, isn't it? So what are the right conditions? Make sure drinking lots of water because the body uses water to throw off the waste. So very important that the person be having at least two quarts of water a day because we lose even more of that. Two quarts of water, the body must also allow the skin to breathe. So be very cautious that no uh, creams are put on other than something like your coconut oil. And the skin needs you to exercise because when you exercise, you increase the circulation of the blood to the skin. So at the health retreat, Steve's doing an exercise program several times a day and he's having a steam bath at the end of every day. What else does the microbes love to eat? Sugar. Almost too late, Steve realises he's just been feeding those microbes. At the health retreat, they don't give him any sugar. At the health retreat, they greatly reduce his fruit intake because cancer cells consume 15 times the glucose of any other cell. Also, yeasts, any type of yeast can certainly feed it. What Steve also had to do while he's at the health retreat, in fact, Healthy Harry got this happening, he got some cleaners into Steve's bedroom. I don't think the window had been open for a long time. And what's, what Healthy Harry also found, that his pillows were mouldy, that his quilt was mouldy. Because he didn't wash in there very much, these 
opportunist organisms, they found a lot of, <laughs> a lot of waste to feed on. What also happened at the health retreat was herbs were given to kill off the fungus. So garlic is a potent one. Also olive leaf extract and grapefruit seed extract. These are pretty potent fungal killers. So what happened is the naturopathic doctor advised Steve to try a week on one, maybe a week on the other. Also, number three is balance. Bring back the balance in the gastrointestinal tract with the probiotic. But also, getting the waste out, one of the areas where waste comes out of the body is not only the skin, but the lungs. So this is lots of fresh air. And of course, Steve stops smoking at the health retreat. It's amazing how quickly the lungs start to repair when the, when the cigarettes stopped. Another area waste comes out of the body is the kidneys. Poor Steve's kidneys had nearly shut down because of the lack of water and too much alcohol. They didn't give him water all at once. He was encouraged to have water little by little by little, maybe a quarter of a glass at a time, and then five minutes later, another quarter of a glass, then five minutes later, another quarter of a glass, then five minutes later, another quarter of a glass. So little by little by little, he began to hydrate his body. Little by little, the kidneys started working. If kidneys aren't working well and a person has maybe half a quart of water, that can be very damaging to the kidney. So little by little by little, the water's taken in. But probably the area where most of the waste, certainly the largest pieces of waste come out, is the colon. And of course, it's in the colon that the probiotic re-establishes the right bacteria there. The food we eat, the type of food we eat, actually determines the type of microbes that are in our colon. So at the health retreat, Steve's body got a real shock. He was starting to eat a plant-based diet. But the colon, it needed to be cleansed. And so herbs were given to help him to move the colon. But something else was happening too that helped him to evacuate properly. This is the throne. And this is how the person would baby sit on the throne. But I'm going to show you in the colon, something happens depending on the position that we have. And this is something that was encouraged for, for Steve. This is the colon. And just where that loop is, there's a muscle. And this muscle is called puborectalis. So this muscle basically holds up this loop. And we're very, ha we're very glad to have puborectalis because puborectalis prevents uh, incontinence. So puborectalis holds it up like this. Now when a person squats, so this is what Steve was encouraged to do because at the health retreat they had little stools in front of the throne. And so when the position to squat is mimicked, puborectalis relaxes. And when puborectalis relaxes, that allows the colon to totally open. So basically it comes like that. And so when a person sits to evacuate, very easy other contents allowed to go out. Now something else that Steve had developed was hemorrhoids. And he was having a lot of trouble with hemorrhoids. So that was another reason he was encouraged to have the stool and have the squatting position because that takes pressure off the hemorrhoids at the end. So you can see 
as the page 127 of the Ministry of Healing states, in case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained, wrong habits corrected, unhealthful conditions changed, then nature is to be assisted in her efforts to expel impurities and re-establish right conditions back in the system. How are the impurities expelled? Via the skin, via the lungs, via the kidneys and via the colon. But the right conditions need to be given to the colon so that they can do this. And so for the, for the, right, the right conditions are adequate water, we'll just call it herbs to move, and also exercise. Exercise increases the blood supply to the colon and exercise also massages gently the colon and then position on the throne, we'll call it. Position on the throne basically is the little stool in front or you can buy something called squatty potty and squatty potty is it's like a stool, but it wraps right around the throne. So it's basically a lot easier to use. And they're becoming quite popular because so many people are having problems in their colon. And you can see that if the skin, lungs, kidney and colon aren't eliminating as they should be, then waste builds up in the body. And then these microbes have a very fruitful um, meal basically they've got things to eat remember they're just opportunist organisms and they're just going to be around where there's something to feed them so it's very important that the four organs of elimination be working well so with the uh, program to eliminate yeast out of the body now as i mentioned some people can have yeast in the body and not have cancer and this program is the same for both. But we go one step further when someone has cancer. Number four, alkalize. So these microbes, you're, they all love an acid environment. To alkalize, it's important to have alkaline forming foods, which basically are all your plant foods. Or the majority of your plant foods. The foods that are the most acid are things like alcohol, refined sugars, caffeines, your dairy products, your meat, and they were things that Steve was eating a lot of, not even realizing he was feeding these opportunist organisms. But at the retreat, he was given green drinks. Green drinks are very high in the alkaline minerals. And green drinks basically are, are green plants that were blended up with water and strained. But also he was given sodium bicarbonate wraps. Now with the sodium bicarbonate wraps, he's basically wrapped up in a solution of sodium bicarbonate and hot water. And the staff would wrap his whole body in these towels. So can you see that we are alkalizing from the inside, alkalizing also from the outside. And also at one of the retreats he went to, they had a hyperbaric chamber. And a hyperbaric chamber is putting oxygen into the blood under pressure. Cancer cannot live in the presence of oxygen. And so all of these things were giving the body the right conditions so that he could heal. It's quite simple, isn't it? And I believe that God meant it to be simple. You see, it is the body that can heal itself. So when Steve came away from the health retreat, he was feeling better than he had felt for a long time. And he went home and his brother had cleaned out his room. He had new mattress, he had new pillows, he had new quilts, and the windows were wide open. And what uh, Healthy Harry had also done, he'd also arranged it so that most of the technology was in the lounge room instead of in Steve's room. You see, Steve's intellect had been appealed to through education. Many are sick through ignorance, not realising what the things they're doing to their body, um, the effect that it's happening. 
Hippocrates made another amazing statement. He said, disease doesn't come out of the blue. But he said, nature, little by little, is, is broken down by harming, nat- by harming the body, by doing little things that hurt it, even just dehydration, late nights, um, food that's devitalized, no exercise, all these little things start to break down the life forces in the body. And then all of a sudden, when it has been abused for so long, then the illness comes. And Florence Nightingale, she said, disease just doesn't happen. She said it's often weeks, months, years in the making. Many people don't realize that what they're eating, what they're drinking, and their lifestyle habits are actually contributing to the diseases that they are getting. And so to conquer this, Starve the fungus, make sure the yeasts are gone and the sugar's gone. Make sure that the body's cleansed by lots of water, even going to a health retreat so that the body is assisted in getting the waste out. There are herbs that will kill fungus and will not kill us. Bring the balance back in the gastrointestinal tract and alkalize. There is another lecture that I give on the acid alkaline balance, which shows the foods that create an alkaline environment in the body. You see, I believe that God meant healing to be simple. And in Romans 12, verse 1, the Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. There are many people that love God, many people that uh, read their Bibles every day and want to do what's right, but they don't realize that what they're doing to their body is actually killing their body. That's why God says, by the mercies of God that you present your body's living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It is so reasonable because we are the winners. We're the ones that are living on it. And then the Bible says, and be not conformed to this world. Have a look at the way this world eats and drinks and lives, and then have a look at the way The people that do that have a look at the way they die. Not in every case, but in the majority of cases, the way we live determines the way we die. Most people don't realize that. And you see, the body should be working right up until the day we die, whether that be 70 or 80 or 90 or 100. And there are countries in this world today, there are cultures that live long life. And you might have seen that in Time magazine a few years ago. They looked at three groups of people. One was the Okinawans, one was the Sardinians. Um, The Okinawans were a Japanese group of people on a little island, similar to the Sardinians, and then the Seventh-day Adventists. Now, they had three common denominators. One were they're very active. The other one was they're very social. And the other one was they eat food in its natural state. Some of them eat meat and the ones that eat meat, it's it's very small part of their diet. So that backs also what Colin Campbell found in the China study, that a very small amount didn't cause disease. But you would, it's a very, very small amount. If we also go to the Garden of Eden diet, we see that God gave Adam and Eve a plant-based diet. You see, there was no death in the Garden of Eden. And to eat meat, there has to be a death. But Colin Campbell also showed how it has this acid effect on the body. So in in, uh, Genesis 1.29, God said to Adam and Eve, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which of the tree is a fruit bearing seed. To you it shall, it says, the seed, to you it shall be for meat. You see, the seed has everything that is needed for the germination of a plant. If, if it didn't, then that little green leaf could not come out of that seed. Some say it doesn't have all the essential amino acids. Well, if it didn't, life could not come out of the seed. So again and again, the research is showing a plant-based diet is the diet that is the most conducive for health in the human body. 
The green drinks and the sodium bicarbonates are the two alkalizers and those alkalizers are the ones that give quite a dramatic environment to the body to bring about healing. We don't quite go to that extent if someone just has a yeast presence in their body. That's more the step that you would go if someone has cancer. And we have seen some remarkable turnarounds at our health retreat with cancer. And I'll give you the story of a lady named Elizabeth Cott. She came to our health retreat, I think it's two and a half years ago now, and she had three tumours in her abdomen. And the doctor said to her, you must have chemotherapy immediately. He said, these are very fast growing cancers. She didn't want to do that. And she had heard of our health retreat. So she came to our health retreat and we immediately implemented these lifestyle changes. She had steam baths every day. We wrapped her up in the sodium bicarbonate. She was having green drinks. We stopped all fruit for the first six weeks. She was with us for, two, for just two weeks. She was excited. She went home and she did exactly everything that we told her to do. And she told me that she's Polish, she's mid-60s. She said that her, at her church, she's the pavlova maker. And she said, I used to make pavlovas about this size and I would put 16 cups of white sugar into those pavlovas. She said, I believe that I was feeding my cancer with the sugar because she's a vegetarian, not a smoker, not a drinker. But you see, you put the detective hat on and you will find out there is always a cause. She did exactly what we advised her to do. She rang me back three months later. She said, Barbara, I've just been to the doctor and the doctor said, come and see me again in three months. Now, what did the doctor say to her three months before? You got to start chemo immediately. All her inflammatory markers were down. Her cancer markers were down. She went back three months later again. So this is six months after being to our retreat. And the doctor said, I, I can't understand it, but he said, one of your tumours has totally gone. Do you know, another year later, another tumour had gone. It's two and a half years now. Two tumours have gone. One tumour is still there, but the doctor said, I don't understand it. It's not doing anything. Dr. Gonzalez, when he was alive, he was interviewed about his success with cancer. He said, it's like this. He said, if someone has diabetes and they do everything right, they can manage their diabetes. He said, it's the same with cancer. He said, if you do everything right, you can manage it. But can you see how education is very important into understanding what it is? One lady said, you can't blame everything on fungus. I said, no, you can't blame everything on fungus, but why is it there? And with many people, it's a different in every case. That's why I say you are the doctor. You can have 10 people with cancer and one is absolutely huge exposure to fungus. The other one, no exposure to fungus, but had a life of having antibiotics every year and a high sugar diet that was actually feeding it in the body. So in every case, you will find there are different reasons why the fungus is there. It's like one lady that came to her with, with, with breast cancer. When she heard this lecture, she had said, oh dear, I said, what's the matter? She said, my bedroom window, in fact, it, not my bedroom window, she said, my bedroom roof is nearly always black with mold. So when she's sleeping, what's happening? The, the other guest said to her, you've got to get out of that house. She said, but it's cheap rent. <laughs> I mean, what, what's your health worth? And then I have seen other cases where I cannot find anything directly that is contributing to why this person would have cancer. And then I ask them if they had a happy, healthy childhood. And then I find that there's been abuse and the person's very angry and they will not, you know, they find that they cannot forgive their abuser. And Dr. Carolyn Leaf in her book, Who Switched Off My Brain, she shows that little thorns can start growing and damaging the tissues when a person is angry or bitter. In the book Mind Cure by Ellen White, well, in the book Ministry of Healing, the chapter Mind Cure, she says grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all break down the life forces and can invite decay and death into the human body. 
Now that was written over a hundred years ago and yet science is now showing that even emotional issues can contribute to, to sickness and disease in the human body. So as you can see, there be, can be many factors. That's why we all should be private investigators, investigating why these things are so and where have these things come from. I was um, talking to a young man who came to us with cancer and he's a fitness guy, very well built, he's a vegetarian. He says, why me? And then I started to investigate a little bit more in his childhood. Chernobyl went down in Europe when his mother was pregnant with him and all the women were told to abort their babies but she did not want to abort her baby. And so she kept her baby and she was told, all the women were told if they were going to keep their baby, they had to take this drug, but she didn't want to do that. And then she moved to Australia when her boy was five years old and he had not been vaccinated. And so when he arrived in Australia, they gave him all the vaccines all at once. And he got very, very sick with that. Can you see there's a few threads coming in there? And remember in the soil, these these opportunist organisms are breaking up the heavy metals, they're breaking up the chemicals, they're breaking up the minerals in the soil. So if there's chemicals and heavy metals in the body, that can be another fruitful ground for the yeast to feed on. That's why we all should be private investigators, just looking at all the little threads that come together to make these things so. And sometimes we will not know every little thread. But remember, God knows every little thread. And he wants us to be in the best health. And 36, Psalm 36, verse 8, the Bible says where God is saying, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. He says, I will guide thee with mine eye. And also in Psalm 119, there are a few verses that are talking about health in the body. One is verse 69, where it says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. Many people don't think about health until they get sick. That's why the psalmist said, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. And then coming down a few verses to verse 70, it says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And how many people it's through sickness that they learn how to look after their body. Far better that you look after your body so you don't even get to that sickness. And staying in Psalm 119, now we're at verse 73. The Bible says, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I might learn thy commandments. What are the commandments? They're the basic laws of health on how to look after the human body.